speak to about a half a million students every year around the world. This last year, I've been in Uganda, Kenya, Cairo, London, Dublin, Switzerland, Mexico, Australia, New Zealand, Peru, now Nigeria, <laughs> and uh, Swaziland on Tuesday. Had to look that up on the map. Wasn't sure that was a country, but I did have to show them my passport. And uh, I will be, we'll be leaving here, <laughs> going to Johannesburg, to Paris, to London. And then I'm on to New York City. I've got to speak in New York City uh, Sunday night, Monday, and Tuesday. And then I will finally get a chance to go home. So I get a chance to hear from teenagers, not only all over the United States, but around the world. And I've learned a tremendous amount from students in the last 17 years I've been traveling. I hope that today you will learn something from me. More importantly, I would like to hear from you. And because of the sheer numbers of students I speak to, I obviously do not always get a chance to talk one-on-one -on -one and answer your questions personally. The best way to reach me is to go to the World Wide Web. You go to www.pamstenzel.com. On my website, there's a place you can email me. I answer my own email. I will answer you if you email me. I don't want anyone to leave with questions that you really wish you could have asked someone and you did not know who to ask. We want to make sure that your questions are answered. Uh, so that's how you get a hold of me. Before I started traveling and speaking full time, I spent nine years counseling in crisis pregnancy centers in Chicago and then in Minneapolis. And for nine years, I would have girls in my clinic every day saying, Pam, I didn't know. If someone would have told me that this is what was going to happen, I would have made a different choice. No one told me. I began to ask these girls in my clinic, what could we have said? I mean, is there something someone could have said to you before you made your choice that might have helped you to have made a better choice? Then after nine years, I realized that there were a lot of teenagers out there making decisions about sex, having absolutely no idea, none, what the consequence of that choice would be. It's what we're going to talk about tonight. I did not come to your school today to decide for you what you're going to do about sex. That's not why I'm here. I can't make this choice for you, don't intend to. Can't go on your dates with you, I don't have time. <laughs> your parents can't choose for you, although I'm sure there might be a few of them that wish they could. My goal tonight is not to decide for you what you're gonna do, because you can do whatever you want. My goal tonight is that none of you would be able to leave this hall and ever again have to say to a physician, to a counselor, to your future husband or wife. Well, nobody told me. I didn't know. Tonight, you're going to be told what you choose to do when you walk out of here is completely up to you. I get to start tonight this way. My favorite way to start, because in public schools, I can't start this way in my country. Tonight, we're gonna start this way. Students, God created sex. It's awesome. It's not a horrible, terrible thing we can't talk about because the archbishop is here. <laughs> it was God's idea, not yours. God wants you to have great sex. He does. This is not about wrecking your fun and ruining your weekend. All right? Remember, you're clapping. I grew up in church, ladies. And when you grow up in church, sometimes you get a few weird ideas about God. I did. I thought God was bored one day and he didn't have a thing better to do. So, so what he thought would be fun would he make a bunch of rules to ruin my life. So we wrote the Bible, the Ten Commandments, which we all know are rules to wreck everybody's fun. And if that wasn't bad enough, I actually believe that God's only job, all God did all day long was stand up there and watch me. So if I blew it, broke some commandment, he had his lightning bolt ready to go fried, saw ya. <laughs> right? That's God's job. Make up a bunch of silly rules and then sit up there all day long and watch you. Students, God loves you. And God's law is not about wrecking your fun and ruining your weekend. It's about giving you the best, giving you life. But God took a colossal risk at the beginning of time. And if I were God, I would not have done it, which is why I'm not. God, for some reason that I cannot understand, decided to let you choose.
knowing full well that all of us at one point would shake our fist in his face and tell him we don't need him, we don't need his rules, God doesn't need to tell me how to live my life, I could do it my way. And what would follow would be sin, disease, pain, and death. Even though God knew that, he still let you choose. God created sex, but he created it with a boundary. And when sex happens within the boundary for which it was created, it's awesome. When it happens outside of that boundary, it's horribly, horribly destructive. Help me out tonight. What is the boundary, the context for which God created sex? Oh, so awesome. Not even the adults either. That was great. Marriage. You don't believe that. You don't believe that. How many church kids I've had in my office go to church every weekend, go to mass, get confirmed, go to Catholic school, show up in my clinic and go, yeah, but we loved each other. So, God did not create sex for love. That is not the boundary. God created sex for one context and one only, permanent, lifetime commitment, marriage. You and you only. For better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, till death. I said, yeah. Girls, girls, I said, I said death. I did not say to my husband, I'll stay married to you if. If you treat me the way I expect to be treated, you put your socks where they belong, you don't gain 500 pounds in the next 10 years. And he didn't say that to me, thank God. I said, I'm committed to you for the rest of my life. No matter what. Students, that is the safe context for sex. And the reason I love God's law is it's easy. Either you're married or you're not. If you are not married, don't do it. If you are married, go for it with the person you're married to. Have to put in that, that in there. Somebody gets confused. Girls, if you have sex outside of one permanent monogamous, and monogamy does not mean one at a time. That means one partner who has only been with you. You have sex outside of that context and you will pay. There is a cost. There's a physical cost, there's an emotional cost, and there's a spiritual cost. Physical cost. The number one fear of teenagers around the world who are having sex is still pregnancy. Pregnancy is the biggest fear of teens having sex. Doesn't make a bit of sense to me. Got a news flash for you. Pregnancy is not a disease. It's survivable. You can actually live through it. I've lived through it three times now. A few extra pounds here and there. It hasn't killed me yet. <laughs> I'd have girls in my clinic for pregnancy tests. Girls are scared to death, waiting for the results of that test. I walk in, look at this little girl, and say, your test is negative, sweetheart. You're not pregnant. She gets this look of relief over her face. Like, I'm off the hook. I'm not pregnant. Thank you very much. Let me out of your clinic. Wait a minute. Have you been tested for syphilis, gonorrhea, herpes, chlamydia, trichinomas, vulvodemia, arthritis, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HPV, HIV? Have you been tested for that? Me? I live in Cape Town. Pam, I do not live in Johannesburg. You mean I would need to be tested for that? This little girl is in my clinic thinking she could possibly be pregnant and she does not think she could have a disease. Students, you have a four times greater risk of contracting a disease than you ever have of being pregnant. In my country, pregnant teenage girls, pregnant teen girls in my country are carrying on average 2.3 sexually transmitted diseases. Not one, not two, most of them three or more. But they were not worried about getting a disease, were they? Oh no, they didn't want to get pregnant. Every high school I'm in, anywhere in my country, every single high school, every single day, I will have a girl write me, email me, or come right up to me and say this. Well, my mom found out I was having sex and so, she put me on the pill, or depo, the shot, fill in the blank. 
What's that protecting that girl from? What does birth control protect you from? Pregnancy most of the time. That drug, that hormone, that pill, that shot that this girl is taking has just made her 10 times more likely to contract a disease than if she were not taking that drug, this girl could end up sterile or dead. Thanks, Mom. Glad you cared. Is pregnancy the worst thing that could happen if you had sex today? No way. Far worse things than that. However, over nine years, students, I've had to tell a lot of girls that their test was positive. Immediately, they want an easy, painless way out of this pregnancy they didn't plan. I have to look at this little girl and say, guess what, sweetheart? Your choices at this point are bad, terrible, and even worse. Those are your options. You had a good choice. That was before you had sex. Now all the choices you've got are going to carry lifelong consequences. There's no easy way out of a pregnancy you didn't plan. Abortion is painful. I've counseled hundreds of women 5, 10, 15 years after having an abortion still hurting. I've counseled teenage girls with anorexia, bulimia, depression, cutting, attempted suicide because of an abortion they couldn't take back. That's not like going to the dentist and getting your tooth pulled. There are consequences, lifelong, to that choice. My uncle is a trauma surgeon in Grand Rapids, Michigan. That's my hometown. I was visiting my family and uh, just kind of hanging out in Michigan with my family. And my uncle called my parents' house and he said, Pam, or asked to speak to me, and he said, I know you're not working and, and I know you might not want to do this, but I had a patient come in to the trauma surgery, you know, to the hospital today and no one's even been in to see her and she's not doing well. And I was just wondering if you had a few minutes this afternoon if you could come up and talk to her. This young girl, 20 years old, had that morning gone to an abortion clinic to have an abortion at 22 weeks. The way we do abortions at 22 weeks is a procedure called D&E, or dilation and evacuation. The girl's cervix is dilated, it sometimes takes more than a day. Uh, the first day they come in and they put a solution that will dilate, or we, a seaweed in there, that will open the cervix. And then the next day they have to open it bigger because the child is, is, is not small. And then this, the abortionist the next day goes into her uterus with an instrument that looks like pliers, very sharp pliers, and just rips the child out in pieces. In the process of performing this DNA abortion on this 20-year-old, the abortionist, as he was trying to rip the child out of the room, perforated her uterus, grabbed a hold of part of her bowel, and yanked it right through her vagina. She was hemorrhaging, bleeding to death, basically. would have bled to death. She was rushed to the emergency room where my uncle had to try and put her back together. Here's what happened to this 20-year-old girl. Not only did she kill her child, but she ended up having a radical hysterectomy. They had to take her entire uterus. She will never have children. And they also, because of the bowel damage, they had to do a colostomy. This girl is gonna go to the bathroom in a bag on the outside of her body for the rest of her life. A safe, legal, little fix to a problem. No way. Abortion hurts women. There are consequences forever to that choice. Parenting is not an easy choice. I was in a school in my country last spring, met a 12-year-old girl, seventh grader, 12 years old, pregnant with twins, delivered last summer. Gonna be a lot of difficult years ahead for this little girl. Girls, 80% of teen girls in my country who choose to parent children while they're teens will live below the poverty level for at least 10 years. The number one indicator of poverty in my country has nothing to do with race or where you live or education. The number one indicator of poverty in my country is single parent households in the age of that young girl when she began parenting alone. Boys, since you're all sleeping because we're talking about pregnancy, you might want to thank God you live here because if you lived in my country, we are requiring the social security number of both parents and every birth certificate of every child born in my nation. Girls will not be allowed to say, I don't know who the dad is. Don't feel like naming him. We will have that boy's social security number. Why do we do that? So we can let him know when his kid starts kindergarten, primary school, send him a note. Money's what we're after. It's gonna cost this boy between 60 and $80,000. Third option a young girl has if she finds herself pregnant didn't intend to be. 
which I happen to think is the best option available to girls, but it's not without pain. It's adoption. The ability of a young girl to take the child she's carried with her for nine months and loves with everything she is, to say, I want what's best for my child, and I'm not it. Forty-five years ago, in the United States, a young 15-year-old became pregnant. She had a lot of difficult choices to make. Maybe more so than some 15-year-old girls, she was raped. Abortion was legal in the state of Michigan for rape in the 60s. But this 15-year-old girl chose to give her child life and then to place that child with an adoptive family. And that child was me. My biological father is a rapist. I don't even know my ethnicity. But I am still a human being. And I still have value. And my life is not worth any less than any of yours just because of the way I was conceived. And I did not deserve the death penalty because of the crime of my father. And I've listened to the rhetoric my whole life. My whole life I've listened to people say, well, every child should be wanted and planned. I've heard this said in the church. Well, I wouldn't have an abortion. That's horrible. I wouldn't kill my child. But if it were rape, you're a mistake, Pam. I don't believe that. I believe that every child is wanted by someone. And I actually believe that God in his mercy had a plan for me. I memorized a verse as a child, said this, I knew you before the foundations of the world. I formed you in your mother's womb. Did that mean me? Or did that just mean you? I believe that that meant me. And I believe that God in his grace had a plan. And, and here's what I know. I know that my God is so awesome and so amazing that he is capable of taking your worst pain, whether it was something you chose or whether it was something that was done to you. And my God can make something very beautiful come from that. That's amazing grace. That is redemption. Even young people who have gone through sexual abuse or rape, I believe God can make something good come from that if we give it to him, if we allow him to redeem it. I've not met my birth mom someday, I hope to. And I know that my amazing family back in Michigan was a gift from a very scared 15-year-old girl. And I will always be grateful to her for that. Girls, I came to your school this morning and I spent 15 days a month away from the 14-year-old I love the most, he's mine. Because I wouldn't want any of you sitting in this room to ever have to make a choice like this. I've spent nine years of my life walking girls through this. There is no easy way out. The best choice is before you have sex. That's when you have a good choice to make. After that, it is gonna get really tough. But please hear me this morning, ladies. If you, someone you care about, were to find yourselves pregnant you didn't intend to be, please get some help. Don't walk through this alone. Pregnancy survival, though we can live through that. I could walk you through that. That is not the worst thing that could happen if you had sex today. Today, in the next 24 hours, in the United States, 14,000 teenagers will contract a sexually transmitted disease. Today. 14,000 more tomorrow, and those are the ones we're testing. In the 1950s, students, we had five sexually transmitted diseases we knew about and were treating. Five. You could count them on one hand. Go find a grandparent. Go find someone who grew up in the 40s or 50s. Ask them. Were there STDs when you were a kid? Did people have them talk about it at school? Did you have crazy speakers come to your church from the United States and yell about syphilis in 1952? Uh, no. I mean, maybe a few people back then had an STD. They got a shot of penicillin, moved on. Welcome to 2009, students. We now have over 30 sexually transmitted diseases, 30% of them absolutely incurable. That means you get one of these diseases and you've got it for life. Lovely, HPV, genital warts, syphilis, gonorrhea, herpes, chlamydia, trichinomas, vulvodemia, arthritis, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV, this goes on and on and on. Girls, 
HIV is not the only disease out there, and it's certainly not the only disease that's killing people. And yet we have girls sitting in here who actually think, well, if I don't get pregnant, or I don't get HIV, well, I'm fine then. No way. Two types of STDs, bacterial and viral. A bacteria is curable. There is medication we can give you. We can take care of that. A virus is not. You get a virus, you've got it for life. There is no cure. We've never in the history of the world cured a virus. Chlamydia, one of the most common diseases among the teenagers here tonight. And yes, I said that and I meant it. One of the most common diseases among the students here tonight is chlamydia. This is a bacteria, not a virus. Easily treated and easily cured. If we knew you had it, we could help you. 10 days worth of antibiotics, now given in two doses, and we can wipe this out. So what's the big deal? I'll tell you what the big deal is. In 90% of the teenagers in South Africa who have chlamydia, there are no symptoms. You can't treat a disease you don't know you have. American Medical Association released a bulletin last year. They said this. Every teenage girl who has had sex must be tested for chlamydia every six months. Every teenage girl who has had sex must be screened for chlamydia every six months. Why girls? Why not all of you? Don't boys get this? Of course they do. Who do you think you're getting it from, girls? Okay, boys and girls both get this. Give it to each other. So why are the doctors telling us to just test girls? I'll tell you, ladies, listen up. Girls, you contract chlamydia one time in your lifetime, cured or not, and there is a 25% chance you will be sterile for the rest of your life. Girls, you get this disease twice, it jumps to 50%. Get it three times, sweetheart, and there is a very good chance you will never have children. I need the girls who showed up today to hear me. Girls, that boy can dump you, break up with you, leave you, go to school, university, meet another girl, marry her and have a family. This is absolutely not gonna hurt him. Girls, you're scarred for life. Of the 30 sexually transmitted diseases, 26 of them primarily damage women. The other four damage both. Fair? Girls, I wish I could make stuff up for boys. You know, things are gonna turn green, fall off. <laughs> I mean, if I could make it up, I would. That would be lying and untruthful, gotta be honest. Ladies, we will always pay the higher price. And I know you think it's not fair, but take it up with God. Get in line behind me, I intend to. Because in case you missed this when you were 12 and had human reproduction and anatomy, we're different. Ladies, we all have an open sexual system. The boys all have closed sexual systems. Girls, we are easier to infect and easier to damage. It's the way we're made. Girls, we have to release an egg from an ovary that makes its way through a fallopian tube that cannot be scarred in any way. If that takes place, when seven takes place, conceive the egg now is to attach itself to your uterine wall. There can be no infection or scarring of uterus. So if the nutrients it needs, baby girls, for nine months you deliver. We got thousands of teens who are having sex who are going, well, it's not bothering me because I've had sex, but I don't have a disease, never been tested, but I know I don't have that. How in the world would you know that? Let me tell you, well, something pretty safe to say I know about you. If there's a student here today who's had sex, let me tell you something I know about you. It's true of students all over the world. You actually believe that if you get up the next morning and herpes isn't tattooed to your forehead, you don't have a disease. Herpes is a virus. If you get it, you got it forever, you will give it to your husband someday. There is no cure. Herpes is not gonna kill you. Ladies, however, if you are a female with herpes and you would like to have a child, you will need a C-section, a cesarean, ladies. You give this child, or you give this virus to your child during vaginal delivery, herpes, and it will kill your child. Once you've got it, you've got it forever, and you're going to give it to others. But we can give you medication for the sores. But let me just say this, and I don't typically deal with this in my country, but I'm going to deal with it here. If you have open sores in your genital area because of infection with herpes, which is a lesser virus, it's not going to kill you, 
that fact that you are having boils and sores in your genital area makes you far more susceptible to be infected with HIV. We have so many people with herpes in my country, we have so many people infected with this, that the medication for herpes sores of Altrax is big business. We now have to endure commercials in the United States. I mean, I'm watching TV with my kids, minding my own business. This beautiful model jumps off her bike. I have genital herpes. <laughs> There's medication you can take for those sores on your genital area. It may cause nausea, diarrhea, and vomiting. Birds are singing beautiful music. There's a waterfall. They're riding bikes, I don't know how. And I'm watching this going, she's gorgeous, people. I'm going to the pharmacy later and asking for herpes because she's got it and she's cute. I mean, let's all get herpes. This looks amazing. You know, I mean, that's Hollywood for you. It's beautiful herpes. You know, people have herpes students. In my country, if you are 12 or older, one in five people over 12 in the U.S. is now infected with herpes. One out of five. Not the most common virus. Next one is number one STD in the United States here in South Africa, around the world. Number one STD is human papilloma virus, HPV. This is also a virus, what does that mean? No cure. You get it, you got it forever, you're gonna give it to everyone you have sex with. HPV is not only the most common STD, it is the most contagious sexually transmitted disease we know. It's not transmitted the way HIV is. Street name for human papillomavirus, or HPV, is genital warts. Basically, warts on your genital area that need to be burned off periodically, either through laser surgery or chemicals. Now, we used to think that was the only big deal. Just get a few warts, burn them off. This isn't a problem. So we realized a few things about the virus. Number one is this, students. You can have this virus and be giving it to other partners without ever having warts. In fact, the most cancerous strains and I need you to hear this, I'm coming back to it. There are over 100 strains of HPV. The most cancerous strains don't produce warts at all. Teenagers are not infecting each other with this because you mean to. You don't mean to. You don't know you have it. Girls, if you do get warts or lesions as a result of being infected with the virus, typically, ladies, they will be on your cervix. Girls, I know when I say genital warts to teenagers, I'll have students sitting out there who've had sex who in their mind will do this. Well, she said that wart thing, and I have never seen a wart down there. I don't have that. Ladies, if you've had sex or sexual contact, and you have not been tested by a doctor for this virus, in boys, that's a blood test that costs in excess of $1,000 in my country. There is no clinic that is testing boys for this. We don't test boys. It's a horribly expensive blood test that is completely inaccurate. It could take five years from the time a boy is infected before he would ever test positive on our test. And yet we have boys saying stuff like this to girls. I don't have anything. I got tested. And your question should be, for what? And how much did it cost you? And I sure hope it's been five years since you last had sex. Girls, STD testing cannot tell you what you don't have. We're now requiring every woman who's ever had sex in my country to get a pap test every year. If there is actually a girl sitting in this room who's under the age of 25 and you've had sex, you are at absolute highest risk, ladies, and you need that pap test every year. Boys, HPV is a little annoying. I mean, having warts burned off your genital area is painful, I'm sure I'm guessing. And I would hate to have to be there, boys, when you had to tell the girl you loved and wanted to marry about every single partner you have ever had. I have to know. And I am not just talking to the students, I'm talking to everyone out here. I don't care how old you are. It is unconscionable that any of you would ever have sex with another human being and not honestly tell them everywhere you've been. Every single partner. That's not going to be fun, boys, for some of you, but you're going to live. Girls, you better know where this boy's been and you better pray to God he's not lying because this is a huge deal once again for you. HPV is the number one causal agent of cervical cancer in women. We now have girls as young as 18, 19, and 20 undergoing radical hysterectomies. We'll never have children because of invasive cervical cancer. Is it worth this, girl? Because he said he loved you? 
because you needed to be popular, because everybody else was having sex, it's worth this. Do you realize that more women died last year in my country because of HPV than died of AIDS? This is killing more women than is AIDS in my country. And we're not telling girls this? Two things you need to know about HPV students. They now estimate that 67% of the students in South Africa who have had sex are already infected with HPV. That was math you didn't want to have to do, ladies. Let me make this clear. There is no way any girl in this room under the age of 25 could have sex with, a, with anyone who is not a virgin and not get a disease. Not possible. You will get something. It will most likely first be this. Here's why. There is not a condom in the world that will protect you from HPV. I did not say it might slip, break, fall off, or you left in the glove compartment. It's not what I said. Condoms used properly provide no protection at all for HPV. HPV is not transmitted the way HIV is. HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, requires the exchange of body fluid. We need blood, semen, or vaginal fluid exchange. Herpes and HPV are skin contracted viruses. All it takes is skin contact anywhere in the genital area and you're infected for life and will infect everyone you have genital contact with after that. Males carry herpes and HPV, not only on the penis, but on the scrotum. And we're telling you to use a condom that protects who? The boy, maybe, not you, ever. Unbelievable. Girls, condoms aren't safe. Never have been, never will be, because they cannot cover the entire genitalia area. And it doesn't take what some of you think is sex. Students, it's not okay to tell teenagers not to have sex if you're not going to define it. I'm going to give you the medical definition of sex. This is the medical line over which you can't step. And if you have ever stepped over it, you've risked disease and you need to get tested. And don't you dare tell anyone you're a virgin. We got kids running around going, I'm a virgin, and they're infecting each other like wildfire. Here is the line over which you can't step. Absolutely no genital contact of any kind. None. That's mouth to genital, hand to genital, genital to genital. No genital contact. Oral sex is sex. Hence the name, oral sex. And if you have had oral sex, which is mouth to genital, you are not a virgin, and don't you dare tell anyone you are. And every single partner you ever have will have to know every person you've done that with. Here's a simple rule. If you will both abide by this rule at all times, you are 100% safe. You can run out of here in a minute yelling virgin. Here it is, ready? Keep your pants on and zipped. If we've done that, we're fine. If we haven't done it, we're in trouble. Then there's HIV. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Every time you talk about STDs, I am sure that the people who talk to you spend 90% of the time on HIV. Now, HIV is a virus, which means what? There's no cure. It is a deadly virus. This is killing boys and girls the same. Death is death. In light of that, what are we telling you to do to make sure that you don't get this virus that will eventually kill you? If I said safe sex to teenagers in Cape Town, what would they say? Sure, hey Pam, I can sleep with 18 people. I got a piece of latex. <laughs> safe. We still have kids saying stuff like this to each other. Maybe you've heard this. Well, I've never had unprotected sex. What in the heck does that mean, girl? Condoms aren't safe. Never have been, never will be. The only safe sex is a safe partner. Someone who has never had sex, or if they have, hear me carefully. It has been five years from the last time they had sex of complete abstinence. Please have them virally blood tested. It's worth whatever it costs. Hear me, girls, and hear me carefully. I could have sex a million times with my husband who has never been with anyone but me, and I have never been with anyone but him. I could have sex a million times with him, never use a condom, not once, and I will never get a disease, ever. 
I could have sex once with some guy I meet at Cape Town at the hotel later tonight, use a condom and be infected for the rest of my life. The only safe sex is a safe partner. What if we didn't have AIDS and genital warts and syphilis and gonorrhea? What if we could give you a super condom? Are there other reasons besides disease and pregnancy we might want to wait till we're married, do you think? I think so. I'm stupid enough to think sex is more than a biological act to meet a biological need. I am actually such a complete moron that I actually think sex involves a little bit more than a few body parts touching. I am so old, such a dinosaur, <laughs> that I actually think sex involves your heart. It involves your soul. And there is not a condom in the world that will ever protect your soul. You are gambling with your life. I used to take duct tape with me. I take heavy tape with me and I say sex is the ability to bond two people together, just like this tape. I'd take a big piece of that tape, I'd rip it off, I'd roll up my sleeve, and I would wrap that duct tape right around my arm, and it'd stick really good the first time I did that. I'd say, I don't want the tape here anymore, and I'd rip it off. And pieces of my arm would come with the back of the tape. Move it on to the next person, stick it to their arm, it'll stick a little. Never as good as the first time stick a little, rip it off their arm. Now we got junk from their arm and my arm on the back of this tape. Move it on to the next person, stick it there, rip it off their arm. Now we got junk from theirs, theirs, and mine. And pretty soon this tape is gonna stick to nothing at all. It's got so much junk from everywhere it's been. You have sex with someone, ladies, and the relationship ends, and you will take the junk from that relationship in the next and into the next. I met my husband in college. He was 23 when I married him, and he was a virgin. That was important to me. I wanted a young man with character and integrity. I wanted a guy who treats women with respect. And can I say something to you carefully, girls? And this might be one of the most important things I say, hear me. Opposites might attract when it comes to personality. Opposites never attract when it comes to character. You're gonna get what you are. If you want a man of God who values you and who respects you, then you better be a woman of God because a man of God will settle for nothing less. And I get so tired of traveling around and listening to teachers and principals and coaches say this out loud. Well, boys will be boys. They're all disrespectful. They just pressure girls for sex. And then they, I get worse ticked off if I hear a teenage girl say it. I have taught my sons to respect women. If they do not, I will kill them. <laughs> Those are their options. And I know, I know that I am not the only mother in the world who has taught their boys what it means to respect women. So I'm about to say something really nice about a lot of the boys sitting in here. So I don't want any boys with selective hearing. They'll be the ones on the bus going, that sex lady hates men, did you hear? She's a man hater. Pay attention. Girls, I've traveled around the world. I've been in towns, cities, high schools, universities, youth rallies, all over the world. I know that here in Cape Town there are boys with that kind of integrity. Girls, boys who do care about you. Ladies, the kind of boy, if you were to date him, would look at you and say, I do love you, and you matter. And you know what? I might be able to walk away from sex with you without permanent damage, but you might not. And because I love you so much, because you matter so much, I would never ask you to put your life on the line, your ability to have children, your future, your education, your self-respect on the line to meet my momentary need. I would never pressure, demand, hurt, take, and walk. There are boys with that kind of integrity, girls. I married one. Unfortunately, as just a small word of warning, girls, there have always been and there always will be boys who don't care. And as long as they don't get hurt in the long run, they're gonna say all the words and some of them are good at it. <laughs> I love you. Well, everybody else is doing it. If you won't, she will, I'll die. He's not gonna die, and nothing will fall off. He will live. Girls, real love respects. Love would never ask you to do something that could damage you for the rest of your life. That's not love. Girls,
girls, I want to say something to the girls in here. Do you realize that you are a princess? You are a daughter of the king of kings. I am a daughter of the king of kings. Girls. Every one of you girls is a princess. You deserve respect. You deserve boys to respect you, to honor you. Girls, you ought to be able to get at the end of any date. Look at that boy. I don't care if he dropped 700 Rand. I don't care. You ought to be able to look at that boy at the end of the date and say, you had the privilege of being with me for five hours and you don't need anything else. Thank you very much. I am a princess. I will be respected. Ladies, are there boys in South Africa who aren't respectful to girls? Let me tell you why there are boys in South Africa that aren't respectful. Because there are girls who allow them. If not one girl in this room would ever allow a boy to be dis disrespectful of her, the minute he starts pressuring you to do something you shouldn't do, kick him to the curb. Let me be clear with you girls. If no girl would allow a boy to be dis disrespectful, these boys would be respectful really fast or they would be dateless. You know why they're disrespecting? Because some of you let them. And you have to make a decision, ladies. The choice is in your hands. Boys are like, well, Pam, you're up there making it sound like all the boys are trying to get girls to have sex with them and all the girls are just sweet and innocent. No, please don't. Stop. <laughs> have you ever been on a school campus? Yes, I have. Pam, have you seen the way these girls are now? They're aggressive. Have you seen the way these girls dress in summer? Just take me now. What was I supposed to do? She started it. She seduced me, Pam. I tried to say no. I was being a man of integrity. It was her. Boys, can I say something to you? And I said this to my kids a lot. Boys, it's all cute fun to talk about what girl you're going to take to the dance on Friday night. Isn't that a whole lot of cute teenage fun? It takes a tremendous amount of maturity, which sadly a lot of you don't have, to ask yourself a tougher question. Who do I want to be the mother of my children? That's a different question. Teenage boys say to me all the time, all over the world, well, Pam, I'm going to have sex now and sleep with whatever girl's stupid enough to have sex with me when we're teenagers. But when I get married, I don't want that girl. Then I want a virgin. You are going to get exactly what you are every single time. You're going to get exactly what you are. You think you can be a player? You think you'd have sex, it's just a game when you're a teenager and someday when you get married, you'll marry someone who'll be faithful to you? You're insane! And within three years, they're cheating on each other, running to their pastor, they're pretty like, he cheated on me, I don't get it! Duh! <laughs> you were doing it before you walked the aisle, you're gonna do it after. Past behavior predicts future behavior. This isn't rocket science. You know what one priest did at marriage, pre-marriage formation, I loved it. Father Charles in Long Island, he looks at all his couples who come to him to get married, and he asks them if they have had sex or if they are having sex, or if they're living together. And if they say yes, he looks at that couple and he says, you have both told each other that you are both perfectly comfortable having sex with someone you're not married to. I get so sad when Christian kids come up to me and they say, Pam, I'm not gonna wait to have sex until I'm married because I'll never find somebody else who waited. Really? Want to guarantee that? Sleep around. Because you are going to get exactly what you are every time. Boys, can I be mom for just a minute? Can I just be a mom? That's all I know how to do, teenage boys. Hear this mom's heart, boys. If there is a girl throwing herself at you, if what you're telling me is true, and it is the girl that's pressuring you for sex, if this is one of those girls, and you know what I'm talking about, boys, that's saying to you and every other boy at your school, just take me now. Little word of advice, boys. Run from this girl. Run away. I did not say walk. I said run. Run from her. Let me tell you about this girl. I know her well. I have had this girl in my clinic for 15 years. This is a little girl who's bought the lie of a culture that has told her what makes her valuable is her body. So in order to feel good about herself, 
in order to feel like she's somebody, she needs to turn your head. And when she's done turning yours, she's going to need to turn his and then 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 his. And this will not end when she's 18, 20, 25, 30, 35, or 40. This is a lifelong problem. Young man of Cape Town, please hear me tonight. The respect and honor you show every girl in this room by the way you talk, by the way you talk to each other about girls, by what you're looking at at your computer, by what you're texting, or what was that word that you do with your mixing? <laughs> by what you put on your Facebook page, boys. The honor that you show girls right here that is the trust you will hand your wife someday. And if you cannot be respectful of women now, what in the world makes you think a wedding ring is gonna fix that? Girls, the respect and honor and virtue you show yourself by the way you dress, by the way you talk, by what you text your friends, by what you're putting on your Facebook page, ladies. That is the trust you will hand your husband someday. Pretty white dresses and flowers don't fix this. We don't have magic at our wedding ceremonies. First Corinthians chapter six says this, and these are God's words and not mine. Flee sexual immorality. All other sins, and I have news for you, the Bible calls sex outside of marriage sin. Not a mistake, sin. And I have news for you because the world doesn't get this. You cannot sin safely. It can't be done. Flee sexual immorality. All other sins that you commit are outside your body. But he or she who sins sexually sins against your own body. Let me give you the Greek word there. The Greek word, there's not a good English translation. We've translated it body. But in the Greek, the word used actually is an inclusive word that means body, soul, and spirit. Are you hearing me? You, yes, it includes your physical body, but it includes your soul and your spirit. A better English translation would be you sin against everything you are, your entire being. And then it makes more sense to go to the next verse. The next verse says this. Do you not know that your body... Everything you are is the temple of the Holy Spirit whom you've received from God. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body, with everything you are. That's what God says. The world says you can sin safely. The world says you and me, baby, ain't nothing but mammals. Let's do it like they do on the Discovery Channel. I get told by the world, mostly on the radio and television as I travel, that, oh, you religious people, you Catholics, just think sex is bad. And the world gets it right? Oh, no, my hums, my hums. Oh, that's right. And the God of the universe who said, this is the most amazing thing. This is the most amazing gift. In fact, it is so unbelievable, amazing, and special that you should protect it, that you should care for it, that it shouldn't ever be taken and abused. People shouldn't be raped and assaulted, that the gift of yourself sexually is the most amazing gift you'll ever give another human being. Young men, your wife, if you are single here tonight, your wife, if you are to marry, is going on a, out on a date tomorrow night with somebody else. What do, you want them, what do you want him doing with your wife tomorrow night? Ladies, your husband tomorrow night will probably be out on a date with a, another girl. What do you want them doing? Or you want to have to tell your spouse that you did tomorrow night. You better think very carefully because you take it all with you. My husband was a virgin. Girls asked me how I knew my husband was a virgin. Ladies, first date. We were both living on campus at university. He called my dorm, asked me to dinner. First date, he sat across the table for me and he said this, Pam, I have not had sex, don't intend to have sex until I'm married. In order to make sure that doesn't happen, here's the boundary. He laid it on the line, ladies. He said, if you can't deal with that, date someone else. It's not enough to say it. For two years, he treated me with respect. He never pressured me for sex. Can I say something sane to you? There is not a diamond in the world he could have given me 25 years ago that was more valuable than what he gave me that day. And young men, he laid it on the line. He was the man. 
He was the one who said, this is the line. I'm not going to cross it. I'm going to honor everyone I date, and I'm going to honor my wife. A lot of you have never even heard your worth waiting for. Hear it from me. The person you're going to spend your life with is worth your best. And you do not have to throw yourselves away on relationships that are temporary. I know there are students here tonight who've had sex. And some of you might be sitting here going, you know what, Pam, that's all great. And I hope all those kids who are virgins are really listening. And I hope they'll do that. But you're too late for me. Maybe if you'd have come here last year, I would have made a different choice. If you're not a virgin and you're not listening anymore because you're, you don't think this was for you, I need you to tune me in right here. I don't care what you did before you came to this rally. I care what you choose to do today. And you can walk out of here and say it doesn't matter. So I'm not a virgin, so I may as well keep on sleeping around. And there's a lot of pain at the end of that road. Or today, don't ever let anyone tell you that because you've had sex in the past means you have to keep doing it because you don't. You choose. I had a girl in Anchorage, Alaska. She ran up to me, got right in my face. She said, Pam, I'm a recycled virgin. I said, cool. <laughs> she said, when I was 15, I had sex. Pam, it left me with so much pain, and I knew it was wrong. And I asked for forgiveness. I went to confession, asked God to forgive me, and I made a commitment to God, to myself, and my future husband that I would never have sex again until the day I married. I said, sweetheart, that is awesome. My Bible says that when you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you, and he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But hear me carefully, confession and repentance is not about saying sorry to God for your sin on Thursday night so you can do it again on Friday. Repentance is a 180 degree turn from sin to righteousness. It's doing what Jesus told that woman caught in adultery, caught in sexual sin in the temple that day. After all the men had dropped their stones and refused to stone her, Jesus looked at that woman and he said, where are your accusers? She said, they're gone, Lord. And hear the words of our Lord to that woman that day. Neither do I condemn you. Get up and keep thinking that men are going to meet your needs. Get up and think the next guy you have sex with will love you. Get up and use a condom. Is that what Jesus said? No, Jesus said, get up and sin no more. If it were not possible for this woman with one encounter with Christ to never sin again, why would Jesus have asked her to do it? That would have been a cruel joke. You know why Jesus said, get up and sin no more? Because she could. Because no one here is beyond the grace of God, and no one here has not been given the gift of God in order to do what's right. Someone's going, yeah, but Pam, you don't get it. Pam, if I went to my boyfriend and told him I loved him, Pam, we love each other. It's not, you know, I want to stay with him, but I don't want the sex. He'll dump me. I mean, if I won't have sex with him, it's over. Really? What's your relationship based on? It's based on sex. You want to test a relationship that's sexual? Do you want to find out if they love you? Do you even want to know? Got a challenge for you tonight. Stop. See what's left. If they love you, they'll still be around. If they dump you because you won't have sex with them? Just learn what that was all about. And as painful as it is, girls, let me be clear. It is a lot less painful to learn it when you're 17, sweetheart, than to learn it eight years into a marriage where someone's cheated on you, dumped you, and left you with two kids. It is a lot less painful to get this right now. Don't believe me? You don't have to. Prove me wrong. You go right ahead and prove me wrong. Many of you in here have not had sex. You're virgins. I have something I want to say to you. And the first thing I want you to hear today, if you are a virgin and you've not had sex, you are not alone. Thousands of teenagers all over the world are choosing to not have sex and to keep their virginity. Ladies, if you're sitting here today and you're a virgin, can I say this to you in case you never hear it again? Please hear it from me today. Good for you, good for you. You have something so special, so valuable. It is worth whatever it takes to get to your marriage with no past fear disease. It won't be easy. You're gonna get laughed at, I think you will. Kids are gonna say to you, you're not having sex? Everybody else is doing it, you some kind of freak, you're religious? You're gonna be a priest, what, a nun? You like Star Wars, what's the problem? Don't listen to that. 
I had a senior boy, six foot eight, chase me down the hall of his school. He was a basketball player. Very popular boy. When the teachers saw him, they said, Pam, that tall boy, 4.0 student, full ride scholarship to play basketball at Duke University. This boy chased me down his high school hallway going like this. Virgin! <laughs> you do not miss a six foot eight basketball player yelling virgin at you. He caught up with me, I'll never forget this boy. He said, Pam, it's easy for girls. Easy for girls to tell people they're virgins, but you don't know what it's like for a boy. You don't hear the locker room talk. You don't hear the boys on my basketball team talking about what girls are easy and who they're sleeping with and bragging about the sex. What do I say to my buddies when they're mocking me because I'm 18 and a virgin? I said, young man, the next time your friends start to tease you because you're saving yourself for your wife, I want you to look right at your friends and I want you to say this. Any day, tonight, I could choose to be like you, but you will never again be like me. It's, it's gone, it's gone. Yeah. Can I give you this verse? Because a lot of kids, well, Pam, it's not possible, it can't be done. My Bible says this, I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. I've asked a lot of 20-something year old students, how'd you do it? How'd you get to 25 a virgin? How'd you wait when there was so much pressure for you to give in? You know what every one of those 20-something students said to me? Here's what they said, hear me carefully, every one of them. My faith was real. I have set before you tonight life and death and my prayer as I leave Cape Town tomorrow morning is that you would choose life, that you and your children's children might live. Here's as simple as I can make it, and I'm going to leave you with this. Students, parents, adults, tonight, all of us can choose to trust our Creator, the God of the universe who loves you beyond measure, or you can choose to trust MTV. Pick. We pray you will choose your creator every time, ladies, because you're worth it. God bless you. God bless you, Senator, thank you so much. God bless you, Swaziland. Thank you so much. Go and make good choices. God bless you.